The Australian Financial Review. Phil, how many budgets have you covered? Uh, hi, Lisa. Uh, too many. Um, first, <laughs> the first one I, I remember covering was 1997, I and mean, give or take a few, about 25, I think. This will be number 25 or 26. That's the Australian Financial Review's political editor, Phil Curry. And what were the most memorable? Uh, it's a good question because not many of them are. Um, the memorable ones are the bad ones because good budgets are forgotten quickly, bad ones linger. Based on that analysis, Prime Minister Anthony Albanese and Treasurer Jim Chalmers must be hoping their budget on Tuesday will be completely forgettable. Budgets, especially the first one, can make or break governments. And the new Labor government is delivering its first budget at a time when surging inflation, a war in Ukraine and the slowdown in China have raised fears of a global recession. That's going to make it harder for Labor to live up to its promises to cut the cost of childcare, medicines and power bills. The first indication of troubled times ahead came with a messy debate over whether to keep the Stage 3 income tax cuts. Hi, I'm Lisa Murray. Welcome to The Fin. Today, Phil Curry on how the gloomy economic outlook increases the stakes for Tuesday's federal budget and raises the question of whether Albanese's honeymoon might finally be over. Thursday, October 20. Phil, if, as you say, bad budgets linger, what is the one that has stayed with you? It's hard to go past 2014. That was Tony Abbott's and Joe Hockey's first budget, which, you know, at the time, but even more so in hindsight, was quite responsible in terms of it needed to get spending under control and and looked at giving a haircut to things like the pension scheme and Medicare and stuff like that. We are a nation of lifters, not leaners. So tonight, we present you with a budget that delivers a sustainable future for your children and the generations beyond. But the trouble was, uh, it was a big bag of broken promises as well, and Tony Abbott had come to power um, promising uh, to fix the biggest deficit of all, which was the trust deficit, after Julia Gillard's um, broken promise on the no-carbon tax. This challenge is not of our making, but we, the women and men behind me, accept responsibility to fix it. Doing nothing is not an option. So uh, that basically was the beginning and the end of both uh, Tony Abbott and Joe Hockey's careers, that budget. So with that in mind, Hmm. what can we expect from the Albanese government's first budget on Tuesday? Uh, Lisa, on Tuesday, according to the Treasurer, a budget that is responsible and and, uh, uh, suitable for the times, and the times are not good times. Uh, The world is bracing for the third downturn in the course of the last decade. Uh, This one is an inflation shock, and the risk here is a hard landing around the world. So it's about doing nothing more than updating the bottom line and all the forecasts, taking into account of all the various developments that have happened in the global economy and domestic economy since the election. And that includes the floods. Is that the world is tiptoeing a narrowing and more perilous path when it comes to the prospect of another global downturn. Uh, that's why the budget next week will downgrade our forecasts for growth in our major trading partners. And you know, providing the funding for the election promises Labor uh, took, such as the expensive ones on childcare and the pharmaceutical benefits scheme, there'll be no new flash promises in it that we know about, other than you know, the one they made on the weekend to extend paid parental leave. But again, that doesn't begin until 2024, so there'll be some funding in the out years for that. As to how they're going to pay for all this stuff, a lot of this will just reflect the costings they took to the federal election, which includes a a bit of an increase in the collection on multinationals to stop them uh, evading tax, and they'll just be taking the axe to some of these National Party and Liberal Party um, discretionary grant funds, and there's sort of a few billion in those as well. But if you you want some big, big, bold spending or you're looking for some savage cuts, uh, it's not going to happen this budget. 
But budgets are a political document as much as an economic document. Mm. So it's much more important than just an economic reconciliation, isn't it? Yeah, at least I, I th- what this budget is trying to do and what the Treasurer has been at pains to you know, stay basically since he got elected was we're broke. The economy is globally collapsing. We should stay uh, out of recession, Australia, but we're going to be dragged down by the major economies in the Northern Hemisphere and don't ask for money. And don't ask for money on two counts, A, because we haven't got any, B, because we're in a real inflationary environment at the moment. We've got this inflation spike. We're fighting and the rest of the world's fighting. And the last thing anyone needs is for more money to be poured into the economy to help with the cost of living or anything else because that's just going to run contrary to what the Reserve Bank's doing. Charm, as I said, on several occasions, we've got to have monetary and fiscal policy running in the same direction. And, um, you know, we saw what happened in the United Kingdom when they got that one spectacularly wrong. So this is more about just lower expectations. It's to deliver what we promised budget no more, but it also wants to begin, I hate this word, the conversation, but that's the one the politicians use, about going harder and tougher in subsequent budgets to actually try and fix the structural deficits. Phil, the government started quite a messy debate in the lead up to the budget over the stage three tax cuts. And it's really the first time since the election that Labor has looked vulnerable. Explain what the stage three tax cuts are and why that debate was so important. Well, the stage three tax cuts are just that, least. Stage three was the final stage, and that's the big reform. So they're just going to replace all the tax scales with a flat 30-cent rate between um, $45,000 and $200,000. Um, but the reason it's being viciously fought is because it's expensive. It costs about $20 billion a year when it, when it begins in 2024. And that's the lead reason for the criticism. Labor never really believed in them but it voted for them in the parliament so it couldn't get wedged by the government as being high taxing and anti-aspirational. But they were doing well until for some reason someone decided it was a good idea to throw the state three tax cuts into the mix as a possibility to curtail those in this budget. It was a real, really premature move and it just caused an enormous distraction and quite a bit of division within the government. The thing's now been booted off until, you know, maybe next year or early 24 for further consideration. The Federal Treasurer today ruled out any changes to planned income tax cuts in this month's budget. Jim Chalmers... Well, the Stage 3 tax cuts are uh, around three budgets away uh, as they're currently uh, legislated and so we've got more pressing priorities in the interim. So there's almost been competition among commentators to try and call the end of the honeymoon. Hmm. Is this budget the start of the hard sell? Is this where it really gets a lot harder for the Albanese government um, and we see them having to make the case for some unpalatable policies in the months and years ahead? Yeah, look, I think that begins on the other side of the budget, probably after Christmas. I wouldn't say the honeymoon's over. Uh, yeah, if we sort of extract ourselves from the immediacy of politics and parliament, the, the general view on the community still is the government's doing a good job. Uh, you know, there's a sense of calm, pr- a return of process, uh, maturity about politics. Someone said to me recently, the thing I like about this government the most is I don't read about them, you know, and after three years or two years of having government in our face, thanks largely to COVID, you know, Albanese's no. He's just sort of withdrawn. But at the same time, the monumental challenges they face are only getting worse. Uh, the energy, I, I think energy prices is going to be the, the big killer for them. They, they know it, but there's nothing they can really do about it other than egregious market intervention, which they're not prepared to do at this stage. So uh, uh, the honeymoon's still going, but I think on the other side of Christmas, um, another, another couple of rate rises, you know, and, and, and another big increase to energy bills. You won't be able to keep blaming the last lot for everything and people are going to start wanting solutions and it's not obvious they're going to have any. So, Phil, we've talked about the challenges facing the Albanese government. The honeymoon's still going on, but the hard sell begins. Jim Chalmers is the salesman. Is is he being too negative in talking the economy down? 
Yes, but not, not not by a large amount. I mean, it's it's pretty common practice, and Morrison used to do this when he was treasurer, and it was common when under his prime minister is always under promise and over deliver. Uh, but I think there's such an enormous period of volatility coming up again with a global downturn. It probably does pay, but I think what Jim is trying to do is just impress upon people that there's no money there. We're used to this. I mean, the law of the jungle's taken hold since COVID. You know, people just expect governments to shell out for everything now. You know, whether your your home wasn't un, insured in a flood, or you know, you want to work part time and you want your rent subsidised, or yeah, you know, I've never seen such a procession come into Canberra as I have seen in the last six or eight months of lobby groups. And I'm not just talking just for needy causes, but at all ends of the spectrum, just demanding money. And no one comes here with a with a like they used to with with a, with a solution to how to pay for whatever it is they're asking for. People just come here armed with this sketchy economic modelling saying this is the dividend it'll return to the community. And I think Jim is trying to break that mindset, even though he did more than probably anyone else before the election to foster it with his own arguments for some of Labor's big spending, but he's now staring at the budget papers and he realises you know, that doesn't work. We've seen a lot of charmers out and about in the lead up to this budget. We haven't seen a lot of Anthony Albanese What's the relationship like between these two? Uh, better, a lot better. There was fairly testy in opposition. They came, you know, Jim and Anthony came from opposing factions. Jim's from the right, uh, the Prime Minister's from the New South Wales left. Um, they both had leadership ambitions. So there was a, a, yeah, I think you can safely say Chalmers is the next cab off the rank at the moment in the current pecking order but you know Albanese was very wary as opposition leader there was a number of times where his leadership didn't come under threat but came under question and from what I've heard now it's it's a it's a much closer relationship both professionally and personally but you do got to remember Lisa the two best treasurer prime minister um, partnerships we've had have been Hawke and Keating and Costello and Howard and both instances they couldn't stand each other so um, (laughs) getting on personally does doesn't really matter helps but doesn't not not a vital ingredient. So so you talked about some of the demands on the budget where are they going to find the money? I mean, but but it's it's really low hanging fruit. I mean, these. I mean, the thing that they gave the Nationals uh, in return for their so-called support for Net Zero was so nebulous. It was never announced. It was never explained. It was never detailed. And I think it, you can safely say a lot of it was just sort of rubbish spending, waste of money. So they're going to hack it back at budget time. I, I think you can expect several billion to be saved from those. But they're, they're sort of, and it's good, and it's good they're doing it, but they're sort of one-off savings, Lisa. They're not what we call structural savings. They're not things that sort of, you know, help the bottom line year after year after year. So the, the really hard stuff they got to do is what you know what we call structural, not just savings, but spending cuts as well. But they've got to be responsible about spending too. We keep hearing of the five big blowouts in government spending, which are necessitating, and uh, that's the interest payments on debt, that's the cost of aged care, health, the NDIS and defence. Now, the NDIS and defence especially are just full of waste, right? The defence is just a, a massive wasteful exercise. You know, the, the Abbott government, they set a target of defence spending had to be at least 2% of GDP. Now, we've got there. I think we're a bit above it now. And Labor's come into that target too. But there's no point just spending money to hit a target if the money's wasted. And, and it's the same with the NDIS. I mean, the NDIS it needs to be brought under control before it gets wound up because it's just completely run off the rails. Um, it was, it's, it's it's less than 10 years old and it's one of the top five in areas of government expenditure. That's how quickly it's it's gone nuts. Um, it was when Labor introduced it uh, last decade, we were told by the Productivity Commission, which modeled it, it wouldn't have never cost more than $25 billion a year, which is about what Medicare costs, and it would grow at about 4% a year. It's now costing 30. It's headed towards 60 billion a year and it's growing at 12, 12.1%. Um, it's, it's, it's a great policy idea, but been appallingly designed and appallingly implemented. And uh, so I, I just suggest that if if the government is serious about hitting us up for more tax and more revenue and more restraint, it has to it has to build a bit of goodwill and actually try and save a bit its, its end as well. So these are all the things they got they got to do. So they've got these huge challenges, infrastructure spending, NDIS, defence, a really deteriorating global economic outlook. It's like a make or break scenario, but the opposition has failed to land a punch, haven't they? Mm. 
Yeah, well, they're still struggling. I mean, they're still getting on their feet. I mean, talk about punch. They had the wind knocked out of them at the election. Uh, uh, look, you know, they, 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 uh, this is one of the reasons why a lot of people in Labor were warning about meddling with the stage three tax cuts because that would have put, that would have dealt the opposition straight back in. Well, David, uh, what we've seen this week uh, is a real split between the Prime Minister and the Treasurer. And Treasurer, I think, has uh, demonstrated his inexperience. He's been out there pushing a particular argument and the Prime Minister... Uh, I think sensibly is, uh, has abandoned that. Now he may well instinct- would have given him a, would have given him a line, a very very clear and precise and justified attack line on integrity. The fact is that this is not an issue now about tax cuts; it's about whether you can trust Anthony Albanese and the Labor Party. So, look, you know, the opposition will respond after the budget. Peter Dutton, as the leader, will get to give his budget and reply on Thursday night next week. So, it will be the sort of first, probably important speech contribution from. Peter Dutton since since uh, he became leader, but I think it's a bit much at this stage to ask the opposition to be a, a meaningful force. I, I, you know, they can probably you know, congratulate themselves they haven't blown up, uh, they haven't had a fight, the unity's pretty strong, uh, and that's a good sign, um, but they really have been decapitated. They they not only lost a lot of seats, they lost a lot of good people, um, and it's you know, they've got a long road back. So what's Canberra like these days under the Albanese government heading into this budget? Is it is it different this this time around? Uh, it feels like a return to the past, Lisa. I, I was, uh, you know, we've I, I think we've had ten or twelve or even longer now, fourteen years of really bad governments, uh, and and a lot of that's been because we've had inexperienced prime ministers. You, you, I've always been a big believer since it was explained to me many years ago in what's called the 20-year rule. You shouldn't try and lead your party, let alone your country, unless you've had you know, 20 years or thereabouts in politics until you've sort of learnt defeat and, and, and depression and and, 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 and and successes of government as well and had experience as a minister and done all those things. Um, and we just haven't had that since Kevin Rudd and then Julia Gillard and Malcolm Turnbull and, and even Scott Morrison and Abbott was the exception to that rule. He had been around a while, but he just wasn't great at it. So you can just sort of tell there's a maturity about things. There's not a, there's not a mad panic. Um, you know, it doesn't feel like a government with a two seat majority. Uh, it feels like a government with a ten seat majority. Uh, and it's yeah, you know, he he doesn't get spooked easy. Neither does Dutton. They don't jump at everything. They don't feel the need to react to everything. They don't feel the need to be in the in the news cycle every day. And that that that's that's a, that's refreshing. So it was, you know, it's been a long time since anyone can remember government starting as well as this one in terms of the return to process, the return to a government having an agenda, that experience and the calm that's around the place. Uh, and in part that comes from the opposition as well, having an experienced opposition leader. Uh, however, I think, you know, next Tuesday, that's when this all begins to be sorely tested that's when this government's really going to sort of stick its foot in the water and uh, and just test reactions out there to whether people are going to come with it or they're not going to come with it. Phil, thanks for being part of our very first episode and uh, look forward to seeing your reporting of your 26th budget. Uh, no worries, Lise. the other big stories we're covering. The Albanese government has brought forward a review into the National Disability Insurance Scheme after revealing its cost will blow out by almost $9 billion over the next four years. Disability Minister Bill Shorten announced the review would be fast-tracked and report to the government by October next year. And Britain's new Prime Minister Liz Truss is under pressure after being forced to backtrack on nearly all the tax cuts announced in her government's disastrous mini-budget. Even though the Conservatives face procedural and political difficulties in removing her, it looks certain they will find a way, according to the Australian Financial Review's London correspondent, Hans van Loon. Thank you for listening to The Fin. If you like the show and want to hear more, follow us on Spotify, Apple or wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Lisa Murray with Phil Corey reporting today. The producers are Alex Gow and Lap Fan. This podcast was executively produced by Fiona Buffini. At The Financial Review, we investigate the big stories about markets, business and power. To support our journalism, you can subscribe to The Financial Review at afr.com forward slash subscribe. The 
Australian Financial Review.